Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for popping in here and spending an hour with us tonight. Uh, welcome to another in uh, Come Out With Pride's A Seat at the Table series. I am so excited for the conversation tonight, a conversation that is both timely and necessary, uh, and also a conversation that is very personal for me. My name is Brandon Wolf. As you can see, my pronouns are he and him, and I am Equality Florida's Media Relations Manager. Equality Florida is the largest LGBTQ civil rights organization in the state of Florida. And if you're trying to guess at home behind your computer, yes, I am a gay man in America. Um, but I am more than just a gay man in America. I'm also a black man living in America. And as we sit midway through Black History Month, I have to be very honest with you that I've spent the last few weeks reflecting on the unique challenges posed by being intersectional. For most of my life, living at the intersections of black and LGBTQ identities has meant not just being called homophobic names in the halls at school, but also being called racial slurs in public parks with my friends. It's meant not just getting the side eye for wearing my skinniest pair of jeans, but also being followed in the electronic section at Target. It's meant navigating a world that often does not understand where I fit and can't articulate who I am. Yes, intersectionality has posed unique challenges for people like me, but at a time when this country is grappling with the concept that equality and justice mean absolutely nothing if there are people who do not have access to them, those of us with unique lived experiences, the intersectional folks, are also faced with opportunities to have robust conversations about where we go from here. Conversations like we are about to have with a fabulous panel. But before I introduce them, I just need to put this caveat out there. I am not a professor, despite the cute turtleneck look. There is no PowerPoint coming. This is indeed a conversation between all of us. So I'm encouraging everyone, jump into the chat, introduce yourself, let us know what brought you here today. We will have time to take some of your questions at the end. And my hope is simply that we walk away with an open mind, having learned something new and having had a fabulous discussion together. So with all of that, I wanna get some things rolling. I wanna welcome now our fabulous panel, beginning with Orange County Mayor, Jerry Demings. Thank you so much for being here, Mayor. Uh, the executive director and founder of the Bros in Convo Initiative, Daniel J. Downer. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, an incredible advocate for the transgender community here in Central Florida, uh, Angela Hunt. Thank you for being here, Angela. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Come Out With Pride board member, Reggie Warren. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna go one by one and, and do a little bit of an introduction. Um, he needs no introduction, but I will turn the floor over to you first. Mayor Jerry Demings, we're so grateful to have you tonight. And I wonder if you could just um, give us a little intro, your background, and, and talk about what brought you here tonight. Well, first, let me just say uh, thank you, uh, Brandon, for inviting me to participate in this event. I have great admiration and respect for what you do with Equality Florida. I've been very uh, fortunate that for many of my political campaigns, I have received the endorsement of the organization. And I, um, take it as uh, really uh, an honor that you have seen fit to uh, support me over the years. What I will tell you is that I was born and raised here in Orlando. Uh, so this is my home. This is my 40th year of public service. And uh, my family lives here from my youngest a member of my family, my uh, five-year-old granddaughter, right up to the oldest member of my family, my 98-year-old father. Uh, we have family members who are, are intersectional as well. We have uh, family members who are gay and, and um, we just uh, learn to respect our differences and honor them. In my role as an Orange County mayor, uh, my uh, vision for Orange County is to create a community culture of innovation, collaboration and inclusion. As we strive to really improve our economy, diversify our economy, and at the same time respect the multicultural community that we live in, we will have we will have to be intentional about how we move forward as a local government. And so I have decided that uh, we will put a focus on that through our programs and through policy development as we drive those issues. 
uh, I have um, appointed one of my special assistants and uh, communications uh, specialists here, Mark Espeso, uh, to be the liaison between my office and the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, Mark is there to ensure that we have the right sensitivities and the right inclusiveness as we move forward as a county government. So you'll hear more about it. Uh, I'm not gonna take up much more of the time. Uh, you all know the history that I've had. This is uh, an honor to serve as the fifth elected mayor here in Orange County. And I've served uh, as the elected sheriff and I've served also as a uh, police chief here uh, in Orlando. And so I have a long history. My wife, of course, uh, serves in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, she too is a friend of uh, the uh, Equality of Florida and uh, I'm gonna say the movement that is occurring within our community. And so we're just humble servants uh, giving back to our community. And so I look forward to a spirited dialogue tonight. Appreciate that. We are so grateful for you, uh, the entire Demings family. I, you can count me as a fan uh, and we're really grateful for you making time for us tonight. Uh, I wanna pass it over to you, Daniel. I know a lot about the work that you do. I know a lot about the voices that you center, but I wonder if you could just introduce yourself for folks and, and talk a little bit about the work that you're doing here in Central Florida. Thank you so much, Brandon. Uh, it's definitely an honor and a privilege to be in such good company with you and so many amazing other individuals that I look up to, that I admire, and that, that I love. My name is Daniel J. Downer pronouns are he, him, his, and I have the honor and the privilege of serving as the executive director of the Bros and Convo Initiative. The Bros and Convo Initiative, we are a black queer led organization, actually, um, to my knowledge, one of very few black queer led organizations uh, in Orlando, Central Florida and the state of Florida, focused around really educating, amplifying and building community for uh, many young black men who sit at so many different intersections, whether that's being black and gay, black and bisexual, black and queer, black and same gender loving, or black and same gender loving and living with HIV. Uh, our work is really centered and focused around uh, creating brave and safe spaces for our young men to, to find refuge, to find support, uh, to find access to services that they may need, whether that is uh, health, whether that is connection uh, to, to food resources, or even in some cases, just being able to build their capability as, as leaders. And so I'm so proud to be working alongside my staff, creating impact, creating movement, and really trying to address each of the various intersections that our young men who walk through our doors have. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Daniel. I so appreciate all the work that you do to empower uh, young queer men of color, specifically young queer black folks. Um, I could have used that support when I was a kid growing up in rural Oregon. So please know the incredible impact you're having on folks in this community. Um, over to you, Angela. I, you know, I have, uh, I've learned a lot over the last couple of years that I've been at Equality Florida about you know, the lived experiences that are different from mine. But um, I, I wanna hear it from you, just if you could share a little bit about your own lived experience um, as a member of the Central Florida community and a little bit of the work that you're doing here. Yes, yeah, sure, thank you. First of all, thank you all for having me here today. It's an honor to be on this um, this platform with you all sharing a little bit about what we do in our community. Um, my name is Angela Zania Hunt. I say my full name because I am, that is my chosen name. I am an African-American trans woman here in Orange County area. And I'm an advocate for those living with HIV. I'm an advocate for those in recovery. I'm an advocate for those who just, you know, who just want to get get up again and, and walk on their feet again. I've experienced several struggles and troubles in my life, but over the last few years, I've been able to do what you call a comeback. And um, being in a part of my community. Um, I work for Hope and Help as a nonprofit organization, and I do, I'm, I'm a member of the treat, uh, prevention team. Um, we do testing and treatment in our community. And I also, you know, I, I, I speak 
on behalf of my brothers and my sisters and them and they to make sure that we all have a voice in our community and that we're not left behind. There's so much that we're still struggling with, especially when it comes to housing opportunities for us. And so I make sure that my voice is heard and their voices are heard as well. Yeah, I, I so appreciate you saying that and also naming where the struggle lives, right? Because so often um, what I hear from folks who want to be allies in the fight for equality is that they don't know where to start. Uh, and that starts by us sharing our authentic identities, sharing our lived experiences, our stories, living unapologetically, and then naming where we need support, where we need allies. So thank you so much for, for being you and for being here. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and again, last but certainly not least, Reggie, it is wonderful to see you as always. Um, you're our resident Come Out With Pride member here on the panel tonight. Talk a little bit about the work that you're doing. I feel like I see you everywhere. I know Mayor Deming said that earlier too, but um, yeah, just talk to us about what you're working on. Um, I am working on um, quite a bit. Um, I'm Right now I'm serving as the co-chair of One Orlando Alliance's Anti-Racism Committee. So helping a, a, a number of nonprofits um, in the Orlando area um, be more inclusive and and be an ally in the, struggle, the Black struggle. Um, but um, everyone knows that my passion is with the youth. So I'm, I'm continuing to um, encourage our Black youth, our Black youth that's in, that's in the intersection as well of being a bi, um, LGBTQ, um, of, of poverty, of, of, of not even, um, how do you say, um, <clears throat> of self-discovery. Um, and so I'm working on um, a few of those projects, but also um, working on making sure that our community is heard and that um, our voices are heard and that I can be a support to anyone who needs it. So, um, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is my going to my fourth year with Come Out With Pride, sitting on the board. I'm excited to continue this, um, this adventure and bring in the um, Pride to Orlando. Again, I'm one that was raised in uh, Central Florida. So um, it's all family and love here. Thank you for having me, guys. Yeah, I love it. It is family and love here. Um, and you know what I love about this group is how we've already identified the thing that felt so othering when I was a young person, which is figuring out how to be all of myself at any given time, figuring out how not to pick you know, just one identity that was least offensive to someone in the room, but learning to be all of them and learning the power that lives in that. Um, so I wanna go to you, Mayor Demings, and you know, it is Black History Month and that is sort of the theme of the conversation we're having today. And uh, you're also an ally on the, on the panel and you talked about how you got there, but I wonder if um, you could talk to us a bit about what it was like finding your path to leadership as a black man in America and, and what you'd like to see people doing right now to, to lift up and empower the next generation of young black leaders. Uh, thank you, uh, Brandon. Um, the journey has been one that uh, I've uh, at times uh, uh, had my difficulties along the journey, but overall it's, it's been a, a good journey because uh, of my upbringing and people who really invested in ensuring that I could be successful. Of course, here in Orlando, this was a segregated community. Uh, when I was uh, born, I was uh, born at a hospital uh, that uh, was specifically for uh, black children. Uh, and that was Phillips Memorial Hospital, which uh, changed its name and stopped serving as a hospital many years ago. Uh, in the early 60s, they stopped uh, actually functioning as a hospital and now it's a, a senior uh, facility, uh, residential facility uh, called Guardian Care. Uh, but from uh, the experience of growing up in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, this was a segregated community. And I do recall as a child in uh, 1968, uh, the Orange County Public School System and the school board uh, passed a desegregation, uh, or accepted, I should say, a desegregation order that came through the courts. Uh, up to that time, there was no official uh, directive that required 
uh, black and brown children to go to be able to uh, be allowed to go to school with, with whites. And uh, I started out in elementary school in an all black school. And by the time I got to junior high school at the time, we called it junior high school, I was bused to a predominantly white school. And I guess the first time that I realized that I perhaps was different <clears throat> was uh, at that time during uh, physical education of gym, you had to dress out, you had to change clothes, you had to wear a specific, a specific uniform to participate in activities at school. And uh, when we were dressing out, uh, I can remember uh, the white boys uh, peeping around the corner uh, as we were undressing and uh, didn't quite understand that. And they would giggle and uh, we were asked, well, what are you, what are you looking for? And uh, they said, well, he said, you have a tail. Uh, I'm, you know, show me your tail. And, uh, you know, I was a little confused by that, but after going home and talking to my mother about it, uh, she was talking about <clears throat> the stereotypes that uh, it was believed that black People were um, uh, genetically uh, kin to uh, monkeys or apes and that somehow we had tails. And so I can remember also uh, being told that um, uh, while I was an athlete there at school, uh, do not uh, fraternize with the white cheerleaders. Uh, because that could get you in serious trouble. So at that point, I kind of realized that uh, the world was changing right before my eyes. Um, old enough to remember when uh, Dr. King was assassinated uh, in 1968 and what that uh, experience was like for me as a, as a young black uh, child here in America. So uh, going forward, I, I can tell you that in the various leadership roles that I've been in. I've been the first, uh, obviously, uh, here we are in 2021. And in 2018, I was elected as the first African-American mayor of the county. Now, we've only had five, I'm the fifth mayor. So having a county mayor has uh, only been around about 30 years or so now. So it's still a relatively new position uh, within the county, but still the first. Uh, in 2008, uh, I was elected as the first African-American sheriff uh, in Orange County and only the third African-American to ever have served as sheriff in Florida. Uh, and uh, then in 1998, I was appointed as uh, chief of police in Orlando, the first African-American to serve in that role in 1998 when the first black police officers were hired in, at the Orlando Police Department in 1951. So you can see it took uh, 47 years before uh, someone could go through the entire rank structure. So for me, what it meant by being a first, many times I was the only person sitting in the room of color where there were major decisions being made about the trajectory of our community. So. Now that I'm sitting in this role, I feel uh, obligated to ensure that we do embrace diversity and that we're intentional about it and that uh, my staff is diverse and reflects the, the community that we live in. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that that gives us the opportunity to level the playing field somewhat at this point. And so I believe that as a community, when we of value and embrace diversity, we are stronger as a community, uh, we're strong as an organization and a county uh, when we do so, and we are better able to make decisions in the best interest of all people when we are not getting ripped apart. So that is what I will tell you at this point. Uh, so I am just humbled that uh, you all are speaking up, speaking out, being bold and, uh, helping to change the trajectory of our community. I would hope that when there are opportunities for you to serve on advisory boards or what have you, or come to work in uh, government, uh, please uh, take the opportunity to do so because sometimes you can bring about change in two ways. You can bring about change through a nonviolent direct action uh, consistent with Dr. King's vision and philosophy of nonviolent 
direct action. And uh, he did that as an activist, uh, but that's largely from outside the organizations. But also you can bring about change from inside the organizations when you endeavor to become a member of the organizations, uh, uh, whether it's government or business, uh, you can bring about change. You have to work it from both perspectives. And so that's what I will share with you about the leadership journey that I've been on. I think that is, um, thank you for, for sharing so uh, intimately the, the journey that you've been on. Um, it is one that we can all learn from. I think it's one that we can all uh, apply. I, I love how you talked about how we move forward with the perspective of where we've already been. Uh, I think that's so critical right now. And, and going to you, Daniel, you know, one of the things that popped into my head was we've got you know, young black queer men out there who who may want to do this work or, you know, may may want to be in positions of leadership in the community, but aren't getting the resources or the support that they need. So I wonder if you could share with folks, where do you see the resources and support um, lacking the most or where is it needed right now? Uh, you know, what can folks be tuning their attention to at this moment? Thank you so much, Brandon, for that. I think, um, First and foremost, uh, I'd be rem remiss if I didn't acknowledge how many individuals, uh, Black, um, that sit at the intersections of being Black and LGBTQ+, uh, especially during this time with COVID, um, the, the needs for so many basic needs has been exasperated, uh, whether that is food insecurity, whether that is um, uh, disparities uh, with access and utilization to, to health services. And so I think one of the very first things is looking at how how are we collectively as a community being able to, to meet those very basic needs that so many individuals who sit at uh, at those intersections do do not get one of the things one of the things um, that that I, I remember about the term intersectionality from from a black woman Kimberly Crenshaw is that yes it talks about the different parts of us that make us up but it also talks about how some of those things that make us up are also the same things that um, are connected to, to oppression, um, are connected to many communities being marginalized. And so I think the first thing is us being able to, to be able to connect individuals to resources that are able to meet the basic needs. And if there are not any resources, us being able to, to create those. Um, one that I think of in particular, we, uh, we have or have the privilege of being a part of a coalition with some other amazing community partners as part of the Central Florida um, Mutual Aid Network. Uh, with Key Latinx, uh, Orlando United Assistance Center, uh, the LGBTQ Plus Center, and the Contigo Fund with launching the Central Florida LGBTQ Plus COVID Relief Fund. This was a, a relief fund that was launched because it understood that individuals who sit at these various intersections do not necessarily have access to, to CARES Act funding. And so we really wanted to be able to provide uh, a way to assist individuals. Uh, and since its launch, have, have done amazing work with reaching over well over 300 uh, individuals in the LGBTQ plus community and majority of them, if I'm not mistaken, I would say a little bit over 40% coming from um, Black communities. And so I think that's a beautiful example of being able to first be able to meet the basic needs of individuals. I think also it's about us making sure that we create spaces for Black LGBTQ plus individuals to, to assume leadership roles. And in particular, uh, nonprofit is something, the nonprofit industry is one that is near and dear to my heart. And so I think it's really um, a charge to nonprofit organizations to invest in, in the leadership pipeline that they have within their own organizations. One of the things that the Bros and Congo Initiative that we really try to do is look at the amazing capabilities we have in-house and how can we strengthen our young men to be the future uh, on a board of directors, to be future executive directors, to be future leaders in their own right and really assist them in that. And I think that's another way that, that we can really empower 
young Black LGBTQ plus individuals from a nonprofit standpoint is creating these leadership pipelines. When it comes time to fill your boards, looking at Black LGBTQ plus individuals that not only um, bring, I know a lot of times we think of the monetary value that individuals bring, but there's a lot of in-kind value that, that, that community members bring. So how can, how can we really harness that in-kind value? How can we continue to, to pour and invest our resources into the future leaders of tomorrow? And so I think those are a few ways that, that we can really harness collectively the power that Black LGBTQ plus folk in our, in our community have so that they can then go on to do the amazing work of being uh, in those leadership roles. I think that is so profound and and thorough. And you know, I just want to say that um, if you're listening at home, you're getting tons of great advice right away of things you can do tomorrow that are that are going to help you uh, realize the potential of your own organizations that will help you build collective power. But also, don't forget that that these things beget the next thing, right? That if young Brandon Wolf in rural Oregon had seen nonprofit organizations and political leaders and doctors and nurses who lived and loved like he did, um, the journey to today might not have been so difficult, right? And, and so understanding that when we build that collective power, um, we then sow the seeds for the next generation to continue to build on that power. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for your perspective um, as a nonprofit leader in the community. And I want to turn to you, Angela, because one of the things that's on my mind is as we're talking about, you know, under-resourcing um, Black LGBTQ folks in the community. One of the reasons that Black LGBTQ folks in the community are under-resourced is because they're misrepresented, they're misunderstood, um, they're not allowed a seat at the table many times. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the intersections of the Black community and the trans community and what you wish people today understood better or more deeply about your lived experience that would you know, potentially allow them to, to see the opportunities for them to be a better ally. So yes, thank you. So one of the main things that I definitely want people to understand about us that we're, you know, we're, we're human beings like everyone else is human beings. You know, it doesn't matter if we identify as trans, as non-binary, uh, LGBTQ+, um, we're human beings. Human is the key word to it all. We deserve Every um, possibility um, deserves equal, feel full, authentic life. To be, be someone who who has been, who's lived the life that I have lived, and I have, I am very lucky because I have the opportunity of being a part of of many boards and being and having a seat at the table. Um, because I put myself out in those in those spaces so that I learn more about my community and I I I showed people that I. I wanted to get involved and know more and know what I can do to help my brothers and sisters continue to um, put themselves in these spaces. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. And I, I think you're right. I think, you know, for me, it comes back to the idea that we first must live authentically and unapologetically. And it took me, I know it took me a really long time to get there, that I, I you know, spent several decades trying to figure out where in the world I could live that, you know, walked on eggshells around everybody else and, and you know, assimilated into society the way people told me I needed to. Um, and ultimately, the way that we begin to break out of these bonds is by living unapologetically, authentically, and then showing up for each other. Uh, and demanding the resources and support that we need. So grateful to share space with you. Thank you for, for again, for living so authentically uh, and bringing us back to that piece of it. Um, Reggie, kind of rounding out this round of questions, um, you are on the board with Come Out With Pride and you know Pride and other LGBTQ events are a lot of fun for people to participate in, whether you're LGBTQ or allied or otherwise. Lots of people want to get in on the on the party and all of that. Um, 
but to be honest with you, for most of my life, those events seem to have centered people who didn't look like me, that they're part of the LGBTQ community, um, but they're largely you know, white cisgender peers of mine. And, and I didn't feel like I belonged a lot of times. So I wonder if you have insight into um, you know, opportunity for folks who lead and participate in pride and LGBTQ centric events to be more inclusive um, to reach a different kind of audience, to, to really diversify folks who are at these events. Of course, thank you, Daniel. So that's how I felt about four years ago. Um, I volunteered with Pride about two years and I was on their production team. And I saw all these fabulous things happening um, coming from an events background. I worked for the city of Kissimmee and events for five or six years um, and just seeing how diverse the city of Kissimmee events were. Um, and I moved to Orlando and I was like, this is fabulous. I want to get involved. Um, and I didn't see much um, much individuals that looked like me. Um, but I knew that I had to, I knew I wanted to get involved. I knew I wanted to do something. Um, at that time, it was about, this was about my fourth year um, going into Pride. So I was about 22 going into 23. And I'm like, as a young person, what can I do? As a young black male, what can I do? Because none of these people look like me. Um, but it was, it, but I wanted to be a part of the event. And once I've, um, said, okay, I know I can do it. I know I'm capable of it. Um, I have some background. I want to get involved and I, and I want to open the door for others. So, um, there, you know, you see a couple of, of, um, of, of African-American, uh, males and females that were working with pride. Um, but they're in various roles and not really um, in a lot of leadership roles that I saw. Um, and I know they have, uh, we have a history of, of having a few um, black males that had sat on the board, um, but not in a, at a capacity of, of which I currently am excited to sit on and um, really help steer the direction of the organization. Um, but it's, it takes someone saying, hey, I want to do involve most of the organizations, they want to have more diversity, they want to um, see what they can do. Um, but a lot of the time they, they have the question of what can I do? What do I do? Um, so it's really um, takes uh, one person to say, hey, um, I want to be involved and then figure out how that works for you. Um, it's a lot of organizations and um, businesses in the, in the Orlando that support LGBTQ plus uh, members and that want to figure out how can I be a part of the conversation? What can I do to be a part of the movement, but have not, no idea. Um, and so that's why I've um, joined so many um, panels and organizations to say, hey, um, this is what you can do. There, there are people out here that's looking for us to give them the answers and for us to support ourselves and for us to lift each other up. And just by saying, hey, I'm, I'm one of those people that are open to having a conversation. You see me on the street. You can email me at Pride saying, hey, I want to get involved. Um, how do I want to get involved? This organization it may not be Pride, but I am here to support you. I'm here to lift you up. I'm here to show you all the, the ways to get involved. And it really just takes each other speaking up and saying, hey, this is something I want to do. Um, and a lot of times we get a little um, timid when we don't see people that look like us. But in Orlando, I found that there's a lot of welcoming people that just don't know where to start. And it starts with us saying, hey, um, this is how we can start. So, um, but again, like this is my fourth year and I'm, I'm not planning on ending my tenure on the board um, anytime soon. But it, it came from me saying, hey, I volunteered for two years and I know I can do this. So let me talk to someone and get in. And so that's, um, now I'm here today in Pride um, and working on, um, with all the organizations in trying to bring inclusivity and, and lift up black voices. So I'm excited to, to have just been a part of this journey with one, one brave step to say, hey, I wanna do this. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that we sort of keep coming back to this idea of visibility, right? And community and lifting each other up and being there for each other. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes that's a little bit of what's missed, especially when we've got allies who are not a part of the black community, who are not a part of the LGBTQ community. Um, they can feel a little stuck and want to save people. And so they invent new things. They try to reinvent the wheel and, 
you know, and, and really what we need is support for the networks and organizations that already exist that are there to empower and uplift people. Um, so I love that you keep bringing it back to visibility and community, because for me, those are the answers as we move forward. Um, I am going to dive into some, some more questions with our panel, but if you have questions for folks that are on the panel tonight, please jump into the chat. If you're on Facebook and type them, um, I apologize, I can't see the Facebook chat from where I'm sitting, but I'm gonna trust our, our friends that come out with pride to, to pop some into um, our little private convo here and I'll, and I'll try to pull some of those. Um, Mayor Demings, I wanna come back to you because um, we talked about the personal story uh, and thank you again for sharing that authentically. I can't let you go without talking a little bit of policy. So I hope you'll bear with me to talk policy for a moment. Um, you know, the truth is that LGBTQ people and specifically black LGBTQ people often don't engage with government and leadership because there's a mistrust there, right? Whether it's, um, you know, the police force, law enforcement, whether it's politicians, whether it's the systems and structures that have oppressed them for a really long time, um, there can be a sense of not wanting to go to the source of their oppression um, to begin to, to tap into creating change. So I wonder if you have thoughts today on where you see the potential for you know, policy to improve the lives of black LGBTQ people in Central Florida and how you think we begin to build trust between the systems and structures and the most marginalized communities. Well, it first begins with accepting uh, people for who they are and not judging. And, uh, you know, in my mature age, <laughs> I've learned to be much more accepting. Uh, you know, in many ways, they've said that if your mind is open, open uh, it's like a parachute, it's of no use. So um, the best way that I think that we can uh, drive policy and deci policy decision making is to be inclusive. So with my staff here at uh, Orange County, uh, what I have done is uh, I don't go around and ask people, uh, you know, what is your sexuality, uh, any of that. I, I don't do that. But in some cases, they volunteer. And what I can tell you is at the high levels of Orange County government, uh, we do have individuals who uh, identify uh, as being intersectional uh, who are here. And it's, it's, it's not my purpose uh, to uh, to tell others what their sexuality is, that's, that's for them to do, but they are part of my staff. And so the best way that we can shape public policy is to be inclusive. And so that's why I said a few moments ago, I really encourage all of you, when you have the opportunity uh, to serve on uh, advisory councils, run for political office, go to work for your government or, or go to work in your business community and volunteer in different ways. Because I believe that through building relationships, when you get to really know someone, that is where you can break down those barriers. Uh, Angela said a few moments ago uh, that uh, there, there were times when she felt that she wasn't being embraced in the community. Uh, but she's a human first. And so if you start there, uh, you know, if you respect one another, my, my mother taught us to respect uh, others and treat people like you want to be treated. And so there, if we start there, then I think we can build a much better community. And it's sad sometimes when a community is not accepting. Uh, you know, of course, uh, I was on the ground for the Pulse nightclub incident. And I think this community grew significantly uh, and became much more accepting after the Pulse nightclub. So through that tragedy, I saw uh, members of the clergy who prior to that event would not have been as open and receptive for individuals who confessed that they were uh, gay uh, or lesbian. But after that, I saw clergy members that I have known for years become much more uh, accepting and understanding. And so it had the opportunity to really change our community. And so I will share that with all of you. That's how we can uh, come together and shape policy. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, you know, 
Um, I, I recently had a moment as well where I, I got to participate in some policymaking decisions on a federal level and uh, got to see the fruits of that labor bear out. It was a lot of late nights on Zoom that I didn't love, um, but it was great to see when an executive order was signed that had a huge impact on LGBTQ people. Um, and I can tell you that the, the power is, it can't be overstated of having folks at the table um, who are willing to share their lived experiences, who are willing to share their identities, um, who are willing to live in those identities authentically, um, because we were able to help shape the policies that came down the pipeline to be much more inclusive, to be much more robust, not to leave large swaths of the community out. So um, cannot emphasize and underscore enough, if you get an opportunity, as the mayor is saying, to participate in, uh, in you know, leadership and government and boards, please take that opportunity. Not only will you cultivate a new um, generation of leaders to come along behind you, but you will also have the incredible opportunity to shape policy um, you know, here in Central Florida and beyond. So thank you, thank you for that thorough answer as well. Um, Daniel, I wanna go to you and, and if you don't mind, get a little bit personal for you um, and ask you, you know, thinking about colleagues and acquaintances, um, I, I've got a lot of folks who want to know what can I do right now, right? And, and, and how can I be better tomorrow? Because I wanna be an ally, I wanna be in this fight. I just don't know where to start. And, and Reggie sort of started peeling back the onion there, but I wonder if you have thoughts, if you had something tomorrow, one action that a colleague or an acquaintance could take, what would it be that, that you think would help them be a better ally for you? Thank you so much, Brendan, uh, for that question. I always, <clears throat> I'm always asked this question and I, um, I say this with, um, in the most respectful tone that I can. I think for, for many of us as, as, as members of the Black community, um, as individuals of the Black LGBTQ plus community, we have always been um, at the front lines fighting for our liberation, fighting for our equality, educating individuals, um, whether that is seen or unseen. And so when I'm always asked that, um, I always say to people, Google, <laughs> Google is Google is your friend. I think um, if you are wanting to become an ally of the Black community or the Black LGBTQ community, it is your job as an ally to educate yourself on how you can show up, um, how you can invest, and how you can support. Um, but there are, I know you told me one, one thing, but I, if I can just have a little bit more time. I also think it's, you know, us making sure that we are supporting, uh, the, the grassroots efforts and initiatives of black LGBTQ plus folk. And so, you know, I know that I'm sitting in this space, um, as a representative of me and my organization, but there are other amazing black LGBTQ plus uh, leaders in the Orlando and central Florida area. Um, who are not on this panel, who individuals have not heard about, you know, whether that's, um, I think of the particular um, one group, uh, Let Your Voice Be Heard, um, led by um, Miles Moraine, um, and also co-led um, by Charlotte Davis, that has done am amazing work around racial and social justice um, work um, and has been advocating for years for the liberation of, of Black folk, for the liberation of Black LGBTQ plus folk. And so I just want to uplift that as well. I think it's supporting those initiatives, supporting those efforts. Um, I'm a nonprofit person. And so, you know, many of these, these, these efforts and groups and organizations are significantly under-resourced and underfunded. Um, we are not afforded the same funding opportunities as our non-Black counterparts. Uh, we receive minimal dollars um, that we have to stretch. And so I think another way of allyship is investing, whether that's a financial donation or whether that is um, an in-kind. Uh, I think of in particular, um, I always love to give examples for, for individuals. I think of the All Black Lives Fund that was launched by um, Contigo Fund um, in conjunction with some other key uh, Black LGBTQ plus leaders that recognized that Black LGBTQ plus led organizations, efforts and initiatives are severely under-resourced and said, you know what, we're gonna make a decision to, to, to invest in community. 
Um, and so um, the amazing work that was done around the All Black Lives Fund to, to intentionally invest. And so I think it's also investing in those organizations, um, some that you may know, but really also some of those that you don't know, um, because usually the ones that you don't know are the ones that also need um, a lot of support as well. So I think it's one, educating yourself um, without relying on Black or Black and LGBTQ plus folk to educate you, um, but also showing up in different ways, whether that's investment, whether that's support, whether that's a retweet, a reshare, a like, um, all of those different things uh, matter and, and really, really mean a lot. Yeah, I love that you said that. Um, you know, it sort of takes me back to something I was sharing a little earlier, which is a lot of allies try to rush past the pain that communities are feeling to the, how do I fix it, right? How do I save the day? How do I assuage myself of this guilt that I'm carrying by doing something heroic um, to prove that I am not racist or bigoted or homophobic or any of those things, right? When the answer is largely there are organizations that are doing that work today. If there is a problem to be solved in the community, I can almost guarantee you that there is an organization led by directly impacted people who is working to, to solve those issues in the community. So I love that you called out, um, let your voice be heard. Fabulous organization, please check it out. Um, I know, I think Chacha was hanging out in the chat earlier. So, um, you know, appreciate you just naming that there are organizations doing really important work today, led by directly impacted people who know exactly what needs to happen. They're just under-resourced, mi misrepresented, and not welcome to the table. So um, that really is the answer, is we've got to give folks a seat at the table. Here we are at a panel called The Seat at the Table, and we have to continue to do that and uplift that work moving forward. Um, headed to you, Angela. Um, and I sort of want to stay on the same topic. And I know, you know, I agree with Daniel. It's not on us to to educate people where, you know, and we certainly shouldn't be doing that for free. By the way, that's my life advice to you. Uh, don't work for free. So if people want your time and your energy and your educational skills, please get what you're worth for it. Um, but I wonder, Angela, if you had, you know, something in your mind that you'd like for folks around you in the community to do better. Um, or to maybe stop doing that is damaging. Um, what is that thing that you'd like to leave with folks today? Um, the one thing that I can think of right off off my mind is to um, stop assuming. Don't don't assume you know what's best for me. Don't assume you know what I need. Uh, you know, meet me at those tables at the table and have those conversations with me and see what it is that you that I need. Don't assume that I need better this or better that come to me and ask me you know where am i struggling at um if you have pro if i'm having home problem with being homeless and living in the streets and you come and offer me a job what is, what use is that job going to be for me if i don't have a place to lay my head to get up and wash and get ready for that job the next morning yeah yeah, you're absolutely right. And again, I think it comes back to this idea that we we can't assign solutions to people without first understanding where they're coming from and allowing them to tell us what support they need and what resources they need. Um, we've got to stop just thrusting solutions on people when that may not be the solution that they need at all. That may not be the support and resource that they need at all. Um, so I appreciate that. Do not assume. That is a super easy one that everyone can start right now. Do not assume that you know what someone else's lived experience is or what support they may need from you. Yes. Appreciate that. Um, Reggie, I wanna go to you and then I've got a question for the whole panel. Um, but Reggie, I wanna go to you and I wonder if you could share with us a moment um, where somebody outside of the community reached out with a willingness to gain deeper understanding. Can you think of a time when somebody did that for you and what that maybe meant for you as a human? And you don't have to name names. We'll keep the tea, with the lid on the tea tonight, but. Yes, um, of course. Um, but there's, I've, I'm fortunate enough to have known a few people um, that has um, come to me in my lifetime that wants to understand um, not judge me, but understand me, um, how I, how I live and, and who I, sh I choose to be. 
Um, and for me, when you uh, when you approach me in a in a manner of wanting to learn and really to better to be a better um, ally friend, um, it's it feels amazing. It feels like someone's seeing me. Um, someone wants to actually know me, not just know that hey, that's Reggie. He always comes. He's a part of this group. Um, he always comes to the party. He he loves to have fun. But to actually say hey, like, dude, I noticed that, um, how, how are you feeling? Like, how, how are you feeling? How did you, or I heard this in the news. Are you a part of that? And, and how does that make you feel? And, and what can I do to be a part of that? What can I do to assist you? Like, um, that, that makes me feel like I've really not only impacted um, someone on just a level of, I've impacted someone's life by just being me and being present in the moment with them. Um, and that makes makes me feel validated. Makes me feel like a person. Um, it's it's very <clears throat> exciting when you feel like you've seen you're seen. Um, not only that, someone knows of you, but they're trying to know you um, and and to get to uh, a place of of pure of of being uncomfortably comfort comfortable. Because most of these conversations will come out of someone being uncomfortable and and just trying to figure out why. Um, and if you really live in that uncomfortability and have an open conversation, then you, I'm trying to, how would you say it? You're, you're living in a way that makes everyone acceptable, makes everyone feel wanted, makes everyone feel um, important. Even uh, a, someone saying, hi, how are you doing today? Um, are you okay? Um, we heard that the law passed. Ooh, is that is that something you're excited about? Just by knowing that someone sees me and, and knows how I am, and and I don't have to be like, oh no, uh, uh and and just be open and be honest, have an open honest conversation. It makes you it makes you feel um, oh, it makes you feel really good as a person. And um, I, I'm fortunate to have this have had these conversations. I'm growing up as well. Um, I went to not so black high school, um, and I've had uh, not a very traditional, a lot of traditional male figures in that in that setting. That really one of the best friends I've ever had um, because you know they they came to me and was like, "Hey, how are you?" Um, it's not how are like trying to understand me and it, and, it, and that's a friend I have till today. Um, and I think we'll never, ever not be friends. And so it really validates a person, no matter what, what place you are in your life, to have someone that wants to know you and that gets to know you and takes that time to hear your story. Um, but yeah, that's my little, I never know how to end I love it. it. No, it's good. I, I appreciate that because, you know, that's that's sort of the goal of these conversations, right, is is building a space where people can begin to understand how to see each other um, and begin to understand uh, the differences that exist in our community, but also the similarities um, and draw closer. And, and I just really appreciate you, you know, again, being authentic and sharing that somebody just caring about you as a whole person feels really good and it changes the way that you move throughout the world and when it happens over and over and over again when people do it intentionally when they're not trying to save you when they're not trying to you know apply resources that you don't need or solutions or or stay silent because they don't want to offend you when they just show up and care and treat you as a human being it totally changes the way that you interact with the world around you um, so i really appreciate that I wanna round us out here with a question that's sort of for everyone. Um, we got a question from Zach Alveson at the Milk District. And the question is, I'll go to you, Mayor, first. Is there a good place where folks can share that they're interested in, in board service? So if we've got black LGBTQ folks in the community and they want to get involved, how can they do that? What are the, uh, the avenues for them? One of the things that we do here in Orange County is uh, through our website, we, uh, if you go to ocfl.net, uh, there's an icon that you can click on for uh, volunteer opportunities. And it will list every uh, advisory group uh, that uh, we have within the county. And then uh, you, you fill out your application online. And then when vacancies come up, 
uh, we endeavor to uh, make sure that we have broad representation uh, on those boards. And so uh, I know that we'll run out of time. So let me just say, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to have dialogue uh, because I believe when you're open and honest in your dialogue, that's when you can grow. You can grow as an individual, you can grow as an organization, you can grow as a, a community. And so I'm just excited about what I'm seeing happening in our community that is one that is becoming a much more inclusive. And so please uh, continue the work that all of you are doing and, and don't give up. Uh, don't Please don't give up. Yeah, I appreciate that. And we certainly won't, we're not going anywhere. I, I like to be an agitator, that's what I tell people. So I will not stop agitating. Um, and I'll pass it over to you, Daniel, Reggie, Angela, thoughts on, you know, if there are folks out there who, who know of people who want to get involved, whether it's nonprofit boards, whether it's, you know, leadership at Pride, whether it's, you know, any sort of organization you're connected with, where can they connect people into the work? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Brandon. Um, and I'll answer more on the nonprofit side and then uh, make space for Angela and Reggie to answer. I think um, just uh, for me, what I would recommend is finding those organizations that you feel are in alignment with your passion or your vision or, or what you're wanting to see change with. Um, and really just simply um, giving them a visit or shooting them an email and saying, hey, I'm definitely interested in adding my, my voice um, to your organization um, in some type of leadership capacity. Um, a lot of times uh, organizations have board of directors, they have advisory groups um, and are definitely looking for, for, for individuals. And I also think it's also good to, um, once you are in those roles, to hold those organizations accountable um, to the work that, that they say that they are doing for the Black LGBTQ plus community. So it's more than just sitting in that seat, but really holding those organizations accountable for, for, for what they're saying that they do. So I would simply say, find those organizations that you feel resonate the most with you, reach out and make contact. And I would even go as far as saying, if you're not sure how to do that, I'm definitely available to, to act as a conduit with being able to connect, um, connect you or any individual um, that is wanting to be connected to a nonprofit in the Central Florida area. That's great. Thank you for making yourself a resource. We appreciate that. Reggie, Angela. I'm just gonna make this short and sweet and piggyback off what Daniel just said. You know, main thing is reaching out to your organizations and also reaching out to your LGBTQ your Q community centers. You know, there's a lot of um, resource out there if you just reach out to the community and ask them you know, you know what's available, what's out there that needs to be done, and how can you get involved? Like I say, one of my stories is that I put myself in the middle of, of so much to I had no choice but to get involved. When I wanted to find out how to what I, when I wanted to find out about something, I went and put myself in those places until I introduced myself to the right people, and they basically pulled me in and said, "Okay, this is what you need to do. Or come meet me here." I'll see you next week at this meeting. And before I knew it, I had got wrapped up and started becoming uh, a member of the class, a member of my community. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, and again, for me, um, my best advice is to, um, if you see something, just ask questions. Um, again, find someone that you see that is doing something that you want to do and ask questions. Um, some of the most successful people in, in the world just found someone who was successful in that thing they want to be successful in and, and said, hey, can you, can you share some time with me? Um, and again, like Daniel, um, I'm here for you. Um, I'm here if you, if you want to ask questions, how to, where to get involved. Pride, we just, did a, we just did a major search for board members and we just filled our seats. Um, but we but our seats are every two years and um, they come at their off cycle. So there's, so there's always opportunities for you to grow in any organization. And once you find an organization that you love and you want to get involved, say, hey, who do I need to talk to? And where do I need to make sure that I'm, I'm at to be a part of this and to be a part of this movement? 
to let my voice be heard. Um, and I just, that's, for me, that's the, the biggest thing, um, to see where you want to go and, and, and say, hey, I'm here. And most people would be like, welcome, uh, especially when it comes to nonprofit organizations, and especially when it comes to our LGBTQ plus community, um, especially when it comes to our um, Black community, African-American communities, we all want to be a part, and we all have something that someone can, can um can give and we and we want to welcome you with open arms so i'm here for it um and i just thank you just to say hey i'm here just like i did a few years ago four years ago i said hey i like this i'm here and look at me now i'm going to my fourth year um fourth of a thousand years on the board of come out with pride <laughs> that's awesome um Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you. Thank you for reaffirming that the resources are out there, that we begin this conversation by living authentically, by sitting at the table, by uh, demanding that folks be heard. Um, I appreciate all of you giving some time. Mayor Demings, Daniel, uh, Angela, Reggie, thank you. It's, it's wonderful to see you. And to everyone who's tuning in at home, I appreciate you joining us for uh, this episode of A Seat at the Table. It was wonderful to come back and host the conversation once again. I'm, I'm grateful to have this conversation during Black History Month. I just think back you know, to, to the early days of my own journey um, as a human on this earth. And I, I think about how much things might have been different if I had had leaders that I could have looked up to, resources that I could have called, folks I could have emailed. So please know that every day you show up in these spaces and you live authentically, you are changing the world. And please know if you're an ally to the LGBTQ community, if you're an ally to the black community, um, if you're in this fight for equality and justice with all of us, uh, know that you being there, offering uh, to learn and be on this journey with us also encourages and empowers the next generation of leaders to do the same. So grateful to be here with you all. Thank you again for hosting us. Uh, we'll be back real soon and uh, we'll see you. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye.